Um, so uh, Susan's shared really a very practical program. It sounds you know, it sounds wonderful and, and fascinating. And um, when I first returned to Singapore. Um, it was a it was really a, a challenge uh, from a professional standpoint to and as a researcher to um, find a good starting point um, like Prof Kwa had said and mentioned uh, previously uh, research in the area of child psychology in Singapore is um, is still quite uh, underdeveloped very much in its infant stage I think and uh, while my previous research had been in the area of pediatric psychology and psycho-oncology related to children, uh, particularly uh, pediatric survivors of cancer and other chronic illnesses, it seemed like um, very much like putting the cart before the horse if I had uh, gone ahead and uh, done that research. So um, what I'm presenting today really is data that we've collected um, just recently. We've, we just ra uh, wrapped up data collection earlier this year um, in the primary schools in Singapore. And we, what we wanted to do was to get a good sense of uh, what uh, general well-being looked like among Singaporean children and, um, and really to, to uh, look at whether or not there were differences or similarities that we could draw upon uh, when looking at Singaporean uh, children compared to um, children in other cultures. Okay. <clears throat> and unlike Susan, I, I'm used to preparing slides uh, for university students who um, ask a a lot of questions afterwards if I don't put a lot of information up there. Um, so uh, so I, I, I'm inclined to uh, loading a lot of information on, on each page. Uh, I apologize. Um, so what, um, what, we, what I'm really uh, looking at uh, as a construct is an issue called health-related quality of life. Now, it's a construct that's actually used a lot in um, in child psychology uh, and health psychology to uh, understand general well-being and overall well-being of, of uh, um, adults as well as children. Okay, so um, I think it's interesting that even though uh, a program like uh, Inner Kids has developed maybe in parallel worlds to this idea of quality of life, which is somewhat of a, a scientific and, and uh, abstract uh, construct that uh, we developed, it's um, it, it has some similarities in that um, we understand that quality of life is not just about uh, how physically well someone is or whether or not they have cognitive or physical uh, abilities, but really it's a combination of all of these factors, including their social functioning, emotional wellness, um, as well as their physical and cognitive uh, functionings. Okay, so. Um, in, uh, in the area of health and pediatric psychology research, uh, a measure of quality of life then becomes um, sort of the indicator for overall well-being. Um, so um, that literature is pretty well established in, uh, in Western cultures, okay, and that's really where it's originated from. And so really as a pediatric psychologist and a researcher in this field, my goal was then to take a look and see if this really applies uh, in Singapore and um, whether or not it was relevant. Um, I should note that prior to, uh, to our study, a few years ago actually, there was a qualitative study done by a professor in the university in, in, from NUS from the Department of Pharmacy. Um, and he had actually uh, interviewed uh, several teenagers and school aged children and actually found that many of the constructs do apply. Um, from the qualitative standpoint of these kids. Um, however, uh, many of these kids would point out one specific area of functioning that was uh, more relevant uh, uh, to them. And I'm sure many of the parents here will, this is probably not going to be a surprise to you, um, they were more concerned about their school functioning uh, and academic stress as opposed to the other areas of functioning. <clears throat> So um, to sort of set the stage for uh, some of the data I'm going to present, we, we gather the information using questionnaires. And um, the pediatric quality of life inventory is, uh, has been used not just in the West, but also in uh, Asian countries. It was one of the main reasons why we selected this measure. Um, it's also been translated into several languages, including Mandarin and Cantonese. Um, however, for our purposes, we um, used uh, only the English version. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I, I hear all the time from 
from families I see in a clinical setting, as well as from my students, although maybe my students have an extra grind when they tell me this. Um, uh, Singapore is very well known for its rigorous academic uh, systems and um, the, the quality of education achievement and high quality of uh, schooling here also then relates to higher levels of stress uh, with regard to this, this area of functioning. Um, so um, I did a little internet research of my own and, and um, it does appear that uh, while there is a lot of stress, Singaporean children are then also reaping some of the benefits, doing incredibly well academically co uh, compared uh, across the globe. Okay. Um, now, but a more recent, um, this uh, not particularly scientific, but the Straits Times um, ran a, <laughs> um, they, they ran a survey uh, and actually found that $320 million a year, which is, comes to, they came to the conclusion about a million a day, uh, spent by parents uh, on tuition and other academic uh, needs uh, for, for children to improve child academic performance. Um, and in the same survey that they did with parents, they found that Singaporean youth uh, were also uh, considered some of the busiest in Asia. And they did this by tabulating number of hours spent on various activities uh, that were not recreational. And on average, actually, they found that um, the average Singaporean child, school-going child, um, spent about two hours a week on recreational activities. Um, that's relatively low, <laughs> if you were wondering. Uh, um, now, nonetheless, nonetheless, okay, in the same survey, 73% uh, of these Singaporean children were indicating that they were either quite happy or very happy. <laughs> um, I don't know who was standing over them when they completed the survey. <laughs> However, um, <laughs> um, now, so, you know, it begets this question, uh, how much stress is too much stress? And could children actually be experiencing a certain level of uh, pressure uh, academically and yet still really be able to uh, sustain a general level of well-being that is uh, positive? So, all right, so we embarked on this study. Um, we randomly selected schools from each of the clusters across uh, the country. Um, we were actually then reduced to uh, the number of schools. We, we actually called every school on the island um, and we only had 12, uh, 12 responses that were positive. So those were the 12 schools from which we collected data. Um, we sent parent questionnaires home and um, based on parent consent we then had children in those classrooms complete questionnaires in the classrooms. Um, so uh, so that we could actually monitor the way uh, child questionnaires were being completed. Okay, um, these were children attending either primary three, four, or five uh, from any one of the 12 schools. And so, and it was a good cross section. We had a couple of um, private schools. Uh, we also had uh, all girls schools and all boys schools, as well as a mixture of neighborhood schools. Okay. Um, all in all, we had 767. Uh, parents and children complete questionnaires for us. Um, and, you know, again, uh, we had a range of children from 8 to 12 years of age. These were the measures we, uh, we collected, okay, a demographics questionnaire, a child, child health questionnaire. We were interested in how they were coping with various kinds of medical issues, um, as well as the PQL, which looked at the overall quality of life and the breakdown in different areas of functioning. Um, and, and then finally we had an, um, academic expectations and stress inventory, which tapped into uh, academic stress experience. And it was those perceptions, obviously, on the part of the parent and the child. Um, so the good news first, the good news is that um, general total scores on the PEDS-QL, we have Singaporean children really falling right where, we, uh, where, the, uh, where data from developed countries uh, would indicate. So generally, uh, in a not-at-risk population, uh, well-being among Singaporean children is relatively high. Uh, the one difference would be if you 
looked at the emotional functioning uh, graph. That one that is actually significantly lower uh, and um, related to level of academic stress. So basically what that tells us is that um, we, when children are experiencing higher academic stress, uh, the one aspect of their quality of life that seems to be impacted most is actually their emotional functioning. Um, there, were, there were actually a couple of studies done on quality of life looking at Singaporean adults and as well as Singaporean teenagers, so older kids attending uh, secondary school. Um, now, in, a, in one of those studies, ethnic differences were actually found, I, in, I believe it was with the adult population. Um, and so we looked uh, at that and actually didn't find any ethnic or gender differences uh, for the Singaporean school age kids. Okay. All right. Um, so, I think what, uh, what we're taking away from uh, the findings of this uh, particular study is that the, um, the reports between what children perceive and what parents perceive here in Singapore um, is a striking difference uh, to what we find in, in the Western literature. So the idea here is that when children are reporting on on a particular aspect of their functioning, say quality of life. Um, usually there are uh, differences between what, parents, what the parent perception is and what the child's perception is. But what we found uh, here, and actually this study and another study that we've just completed, is that we, we find that the parent-child report is very similar. And the, level, the degree of agreement is extraordinarily high. Uh, for, uh, and so um, <laughs> the, the first time I said this to someone, they said, well, now, did you let the children, were the parents there when the, the children were <laughs> completing the questionnaire? And, which was why I said at the very beginning, no, we, we actually controlled for that. And so the children completed questionnaires in the presence of a research assistant without the presence of their parents. Um, so, um, but th this, this has been a finding that we've had across two studies now. And, um, and we find, you know, and, and that actually can be helpful particularly when we're talking about working with uh, parents or children in, in clinical settings, in hospital settings, when a child is too ill to give us a ra to complete rating scales, for example, we can um, at least get the rating from a parent and, you know, and uh, use that at, as a, a proxy for, for the child. Um, so um, one of the, I think it, it just stood out to me as one of the, uh, a, a pretty, interesting cultural uh, difference in terms of ratings and uh, performance. So um, the other piece, I guess, is that it's common, like I said, among parents who will come in to see me in a clinical situation, they will talk about how much the academic stress is affecting the child's uh, emotional well-being. Um, now, some of this data is actually kind of pointing in that, that direction, that when there is academic stress, a child may over, if you ask them, are you happy, they'll say, um, yes, I'm quite happy, or I'm very happy. Um, but that there are several components that go into that, that assessment. They may be feeling anxious and having chronic stomach aches from uh, having tests and being, staying up at night or picking at their fingernails the night before a test. But asked if they're happy, they may think, well, um, you know, I'm not sad, and you know, and <laughs> I, you know, I, and I have a home, and I have toys, and so yes, I am happy. But that does that mean that they're overall coping optimally with uh, with academic stress? Well, I think that's a question that we uh, we need to explore further. Um, so. Um, the other piece, I think, from a positive psychology standpoint, as we're here to talk about psychological well-being, is that it's possible that their academic stress may have a, what we could conceive as a compartmentalized effect on well-being. So um, while a child might get frustrated by demands of school, they're able to sort of put that aside. And during the two hours a week when they're playing and they're um, able to go swimming and do other fun things, um, they're actually enjoying that time and aware that, you know, that um, even though there are difficulties with schoolwork or a particular test coming up, um, that that doesn't always impact on the rest of their well-being. Um, thank you very much for your attention.